Well, balanced funds are currently basking in three year plus of good returns as just about all asset classes except cash have done very well for investors. Hardly a bad apple in the bowl, but to discuss how Stanlib's balanced fund is positioned for 2014 and beyond, earlier on I spoke to Herman van Velzer, head of our balanced franchise, or Stanlib's balanced franchise rather, and spoke to him about the excess liquidity driving the market at the moment. The investors are somewhat shell-shocked to see the quantum of liquidity around and the impact on markets. We've seen intrinsic value, which was driven by margin expansion, a bit of volume growth uh, come through in the last few years, but that has probably run its course today. So we've seen the best of the intrinsic value of markets uh, come through, and today uh, we have we really living off liquidity that's out there. Now, we've recently been discussing on the news desk this disconnect between the underlying economic fundamentals and the markets. That's what we're talking about here, this, this huge chasm that is forming and that surely has got to be sending out warning bells. I think the warning bells on emerging markets have been ringing loud and clear and performance of emerging markets have been pretty dismal compared to some of the developed markets. In terms of our, our positioning is very much focused on uh, getting the best out of the developed markets and the inside underweight in emerging markets. But that's only after story. The real next phase is the business cycle improving. So we're seeing better growth into the new year, but most of that will probably be discounted uh, should liquidity reduce. Are you net positive or net negative? Let me keep it at a very broad question. Uh, we would be marginal positive. We would be probably getting more concerned as time progresses. We started reducing equity some time ago, uh, specifically the emerging markets. But developed markets, we probably think maybe some more action. Let's chat a bit about that asset allocation. Now, you've said emerging markets have been underperforming. You're reducing equities in that positioning. In terms of the developed markets, where specifically are we talking Euro US? Now, the US uh, it remains still the powerhouse in the developed world. That's after world's market cap, so uh, to be finding value in that area seems quite uh, is apparent. And our overweight to US remains, and Japan, that will be the two big overweights in the developed market. Underweight, all emerging markets, including South Africa. So that's really a strategy that we will apply today. All right, now this is interesting. We're underweight South Africa and we are hitting new record all-time highs on a daily basis. It has to reverse at some time, is that what you're saying? Well, if you look at all the drivers of the, the South African market, the only one that is standing out is just the global business cycle adjustment. Your intrinsic value, margins, consumer, our own data, uh, and nothing is actually working in our favor. We really are struggling to make uh, to make some a bullish uh, scenario for South Africa. Bonds, where do you stand on domestic bonds? The bond trade for some time has been pretty well flagged. We've seen the dry run with the quantitative easing issues in June. So in June we had a dry run on what could probably lie in store. Bond markets re reacted quite quickly in terms of the adjustment to liquidity. We are of the opinion that liquidity will, will reduce, well, actually will change going forward into the new year. So tapering will happen. You think tapering will happen before the end of the year? No, no, sorry, in the new year. In the new year. The oh, new we've year. got so to clarify yeah, that stuff. So tapering will be definitely happen in the new year. Uh, and the trade is pretty well flagged. We know that if tapering occurs, emerging markets will definitely suffer as a result of liquidity withdrawal and uh, the bond markets will reprice. So from our point of view, to be conservative, to try and eke out the last bit out of an asymmetrical trade being a lot more risk and very little excess return, uh, given where inflation is, uh, we would probably be retaining our stance. would be quite underweight fixed interest and especially bonds. Cash will continue to be the underperformer? Cash is probably a good place to start considering as an alternative because you get at least the uh, zero risk of capital depreciation. And there are a couple of instruments in the cash market, like income funds, that we sort of prefer over normal uh, money market, uh, are becoming a reasonable good safe haven. So from our point of view, uh, it's, you don't really need to try and get the last out of the asset. Uh, income funds and global equities will probably be our sort of focus at the moment. If global equities are your focus, can you give me a little more clarity about what specific global equities are in focus at the moment? What are you buying? Uh, consumer discretionary is still, uh, in our opinion, a good place to be. Tech, the, I mean, every good tech story has an exceptional silver lining, uh, and there are a phenomenal amount of tech out there, especially media. Media shares have done very well, and they continue to do so. 
as content and advertising has moved from the traditional media into electronic format. Uh, I mean, I think most investors were a little bit surprised how well Facebook's doing, and that's sort of a, a sort of the the, uh, the bellwether now of, of media, uh, given that's where you'll see the the, the ad, ad spend, and where we know the the immediate effect from ad spend back to actual views and and company performance. On the back of that, how do you feel about the Twitter IPO? It's interesting. Uh, it's sooner than we thought. We would have expected it to be maybe a year or two later, compared to Facebook and Google, which uh, took a, a lot longer before coming to the market. Uh, it's, uh, I think investors will be hard pressed to ignore it. The, the, the issue is small, so it's not exactly a, uh, an in abundance. So the shortage in stock and the views around that will probably be attractive. So our view is that uh, it will be uh, people will be adding to it. So it will be definitely. So be tech another. is the exciting story that you media you've seen. media rather media. media tech, which is now today are classified as tech because there's very little media that's classified in publishing. So oh, I like that as being a media player. Uh, yes. Hot up in the South African space as well, in the African space. Top domestic equity holdings and BHP Billiton. You must be smiling broadly. This is a stock that, in rand terms, has hit an all-time high. Uh, Bronwyn, I think for the last few years coming to the show, uh, BHP has sort of stood head and shoulders above uh, all the other miners that we have, uh, have available to the team. Interesting about BHP is just that phenomenal volume growth at the low end of the cost curve. And those projects are, uh, were implemented some time ago, they are in full swing, and we see them every quarter report earning, uh, sorry, uh, volume growth in, in excess of expectations. And if you look at a business like BHP with a great ore resource, a good capital structure, well managed, and, and massive projects, you can probably bet that we will probably stay with that. It just remains. So you're going to stay with it? You're not going to let it go anytime soon? No, it's, uh, we've, we've argued the point around switching into Anglo or, or considering some of the uh, recovery in, uh, shares in, in, in the sector. Uh, but, but if you consider everything, you're still way off keeping BHP Billiton. And the differential between BHP and the other miners is just uh, widening just about month, month on month. Sassel is another firm player that you've been chatting about for a long time. You're not going to pull out of this position now, are you? Sassel was maybe a little bit different. We were probably later in Sassel than what we've been for in other shares. But uh, uh, our views on Sassel has moderated. We think, oh, the, uh, it, is, it has done a lot. But the essence of Sassel is the, new S the, is the cost cutting initiatives. Is a, uh, investors are somewhat uh, doubtful that uh, the targets of management will be achieved, and management seems to say they are uh, under promising. A and management, as in David Constable. David Constable, and he's sort of uh, taken his stance forward that the company has to be more competitive globally and milk more competitive in, in its own in its own markets. So we, we sort of uh, think that will be the second leg in Sassel. The first leg has been the currency and the oil price and the sort of uh, better comfort around capital projects that is coming through. And now the, the next leg will be the cost cutting. So if you follow management and maybe exceed what they will achieve, um, we we'll probably think we'll be, it's a reasonable place to be. The, the rand hedges within the, the portfolio, with the, the dollar rand where it is right now, I mean, is that something that you, you play specifically? Yeah. I'll. I'll all our top four are all rand edges. I would say at least 50% of the portfolio is focused in big cap rand edges. When, uh, and that sort of fits back to our strategy of being very cautious on em emerging markets and being that they're not attractive in, in a number of fronts. And that sort of gives us the comfort that should the world uh, adjust to tapering and liquidity adjust, uh, the rand edge shares uh, are a good place to be. Another theme that came about last night is that MediClinic is actually a rand hedge. Have you been looking at that stock in that light? Uh, Ron, we have our own uh, group of medical shares and that excludes medical, me, uh, MediClinic, but we do own Life Health and Netcare and Aspen. So we have Aspen uh, is, is not a, is, is a, would be more classified into rand hedge strategy. But um, from our views, there's uh, Netcare and Life Health being a South African play. And if you have to pick two South African shares that we've been following for some time and been in the portfolio for a few years, uh, irrespective of the price movement that has been uh, on our, our hospitals. So in that hospital market, we more focus the opportunities in South Africa, surprise, surprise, because competition in the hospital sector is actually quite low. And uh, these guys are able to, to grow their book quite quickly. 
Vodacom and MTN in your top 10. You've got bigger exposure on MTN. In fact, that's your, your second biggest domestic holding. And Vodacom's still within that, that top 10. If I made you choose between the two, I think I've asked you this question before. Could you, or would you, do you want exposure to both? We see that they are actually quite different companies. Vodacom to us is, is can work as an asset allocation cash diversifier. Your yield in Vodacom exceeds that we get in the money market. And given that rates are, sh are sort of anchored at these levels, uh, we, we use Vodacom as a, as a growing, as it's got a, a moderate earnings growth base and the payout ratios will remain high. So we see that as a, an asset allocation development rather than an outright bullish view on, on mobile. MTN is the growth story in Africa. If you're bullish in Africa, you want frontier markets, uh, you look at wherever, the, every, wherever if MTN sort of invests, uh, you'll be, that's our place to be. So you grow your subscribers by 20 million a year, it's going to be a good payoff ratio for shareholders. And, it's got a, and it pays out a decent dividend as well. So from that point of view, we, we see MTN as the growth share, uh, Vodacom is more a, a, a dividend play.